Hi, I'm Mars Girl. I'm Josh Knight the First. And welcome to episode 112 of Mokori Play, the only podcast dedicated solely to all things City Hunter. On today's podcast, we're going to cover season 2, episode 60 of City Hunter, titled Love is Magic, Miss Magician with a Male Phobia. Hey, how'd you like last week where we went on and on for an exorbitant amount of time? Twice the length of our average episode. And longer than the length of the movie itself that we were talking about. Oh, actually, it's about equal if you take out all the parts of us talking around the movie. It's about equal. Okay. Okay. That's that's fine. Try, I would know I edited the thing and it took so long. I know. And we love Josh around here because he does a good job. Well, thank he, you. He, do, he does good work. Guys, I wish you would tell him that too. You, you should tell him that. Go find him on Twitter. I'm on there somewhere. Usually we mention that at the end of the podcast, but I'm, I'm out there. <laughs> but before we get into talking about today's episode, which is a nice one-off. We don't have to worry about a movie. And we it's don't the have last to- one of the season that's a one-off. It is the last one of the season. We're down to the wire here. Last four episodes of the season. Yeah. We have to talk about the new teaser for the Netflix movie for the live-action City Hunter adaptation. I'm excited about it. I'm feeling pretty good about the tone of it so far. Although, like, as we already knew, it's done in modern-day Japan and not the 1980s. But aside from that, it's mostly tonally accurate as far as I can tell. From everything I'm seeing, Ryohei Suzuki's portrayal of Ryo, I was a little worried about it. Because the first image we got and the first, like, hints of it seemed like, well, maybe they're going to make it a little too serious. But thankfully, right off the bat, in this teaser, he's humming Ode to Joy, but singing about Mokori Babes. And I felt so much better. It's correct. You know, I've seen one critique. This was over on Blue Sky from somebody I found on Blue Sky, who's just concerned that the portrayal of City Hunter has never morphed or changed over time. And usually you'd be like, oh, why would you want anything to change but like I kind of get it because some people don't want your protagonist to be nearly as horny as Rio is and capable of assault <laughs> to the extent that Rio is capable now to of be fair things. we do see him there in the trailer hitting on Sayako and then immediately getting a gun in his face yeah and I think that's why we put up with it I think because like he gets punished for it a lot the way this other person kind of portrayed it that I was reading is like they just let him get away with it and I'm not sure that's super accurate. No, no, because like we've talked about at least here on the show, as far as the series goes, as far as the movies, and even the French movie, anytime that Rio has done something horny on Maine, Cowdy, more often than not, is the one there to be the police, to stop him and make sure that he doesn't go over the edge. And we don't see a lot of that here in this teaser, but again, it is a teaser, and Ryohei Suzuki did say on his own Twitter that there's a longer version, a full trailer coming, which we should be getting any time now. Which is interesting because this is not an insignificant trailer honestly we've got quite a bit of information from this this is basically the entire setup of what makes city hunter this is like the first five to six episodes worth of information yeah because as we can see here we see that makimura is going to die again but the biggest <laughs> difference now is that it looks like kaori saw it happen this she time she either saw it happen or saw like the build up to it i don't know know that in the anime or maybe even in the manga that she even knew that what he was doing was nearly as dangerous as it actually was but now it seems pretty clear that she witnesses it at least be like oh my god somebody is after my brother maybe they were in his apartment or something there's a truck involved I don't know if they're in the same scene or not that is hard to tell that is hard we know it's the same night obviously because it's raining yes but beyond that it looks like yeah we're covering the basics of Ryo getting revenge on... Now, we're not sure who he's getting revenge on, actually, whether it's going to be Red Pegasus again, or because of... I don't think that's that big of a spoiler, because we did kind of cover it already. In Angel Dust, they do kind of fold back in Red Pegasus into the manga overarching evil organization Union Teope. Yeah, they finally, like, fixed it, (laughs) because they never got far enough in the TV series to address Union Teope and Ryo's adoptive dad and shit like that. I don't know that they're even gonna go that far in this movie. I doubt, like, we're even gonna get a hint of Rio's dad. I feel like that's way too early for that. And I know it's not a lot to go off for a little less than a minute, 15 seconds, but the way they look like they're approaching this looks like they could be setting them up for sequels. It only looks like they're covering so much. Sure, I would agree. so much more story to be told. I would agree with that, yeah.
Yeah. But for sure, we see Kabuki Cho, you know, and that makes sense because that's in Shinjuku. We see Ryo at some, like, cosplay event. Yeah, I wonder if that's not too dissimilar from, like, we've seen him have to protect musical idols before in past episodes and stuff. And, like, cosplay idols aren't that much different, right? No. Is, is the person he's protecting for the length of this particular movie, like, a cosplay idol? It could be. We like, don't know whether or not there's, like, many cases involved in the plot of the movie. I'm we just don't know thinking, that. I'm just thinking there could be a slightly modern twist on a case that has been done in the manga and the anime before, where, like, you can tell that idol story over and over and over again for decades because idol culture has only changed so much, That is right? true. That's very true. But you make it unique by saying, oh, well, it's a cosplay idol now, not just a singer idol. Although cosplayers sometimes do put out albums They do. There. That is very true. Now, the thing about it was when this dropped, we were actually in the middle of a, a movie premiere out here in LA and both of our phones started going off like... And then we got out of the theater and we see, oh, we got DMs. Oh, we got people tagging us. Man, we were not the first ones on this. <laughs> I look at it this way. We got DMs about TM network because <laughs> TM Network is back with a new version of Get Wild called Get Wild Continual. I mean, the opening part of it sounds identical to just regular old Get Wild so far, so they're definitely holding out. They don't want you to know what it sounds like until it drops. That's right. what this seems like to me. The good news is we only have to wait a little over a month. The Mini Cooper is here. The Mini Cooper is there. The right Mini Cooper. It's not a modern Mini Cooper. No, no. They have to choose like a 1960s Mini Cooper like every single time. That's the good thing about any good adaptation, including the French one, is that they get like a 1960s model Mini Cooper. And shockingly enough, the Jackie Chan movie also, for about two seconds, had a 1960s Mini Cooper. Now, now, let, let's like, be Mini fair Cooper. here. It was five seconds. Okay, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, pardon me. Five seconds. And that's another thing that I thought was really funny was like, finally, and maybe it was because we've been pushing it we for can the last only year hope. or so, people are admitting, you know, maybe the Jackie Chan City Hunter movie is not a very good City Hunter adaptation. I know, because, like, <laughs> in at least as far as I could see on Twitter, less so on YouTube, because apparently all the YouTube comments are positive City Hunter fans that are coming out of the woodwork. Right, where have you guys been? Yeah, where are y'all at? Thank God you exist, but where have you been? I'm, yeah, where y'all been? I'm very grateful that you exist. But yeah, there's still, there's always the handful of people that are like, it's never gonna be better than the Jackie Chan movie. Like, really? Like, you wouldn't say this shit about Dragon Ball or One Piece, both of which were also shown in Jump titles, but you're more than okay to say that shit about City Hunter. Like, I don't understand. Like, like people have been putting it that way. Tell me you don't know anything about City Hunter without telling me you don't know anything about City Hunter. Like, I doubt people even know that it was based on a manga. They just think it's based on a fucking Jackie Chan movie. They think Jackie Chan originated City Hunter. That's what people think. They don't know. They don't. They don't know. And I admit, when I was looking through anime, I was like, is this anime the same property as the Jackie Chan movie? That's how my brain phrased it when I went looking for the City Hunter anime, right? Originally, like, yeah. Are these things related to each other? And the answer was, extremely loosely, yes. And then I left it at that, and then I left Jackie Chan City Hunter alone, and then I went and I watched the anime. That's exactly what I did, and now I'm hoping, I'm hoping And now you host a podcast. Learning. Yeah, crazy how that worked out. And then I saw like a grand total of three people like, wow, like the K-drama? Suddenly these people showed up. Well, no, to be <laughs> fair, there are some very avid fans of the K-drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which has a similar tone, but has taken a lot of liberties with the plot and names and things like that. At least it's supposedly not bad. <laughs> no, I hear it's very entertaining, but people could also say that about the Jackie Chan one. But I have to reserve judgment. Because we haven't actually watched the K-drama yet. Exactly, yeah. And I haven't seen anything of it, quite honestly honestly. I saw some clips and I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. So like I, I could, just left I it I could alone. sooner talk about the Angel Heart live action than I could the 
Korean version. Well, I watched two full episodes of live action Angel Heart. I watched so. those with you. Yeah. Yeah, and so it would, you know, it's not bad. Yeah, I, I read some of the manga. I watched a few of the anime episodes, too. I kind of know what's going on with that. Like, I doubt we're going to get to Netflix Angel Heart. I don't see that happening anytime soon. Why would we need to? Japan already made a live action Angel I mean, Angel with Heart. these actors, with Ryohei Suzuki and everybody who's doing it for this movie that's about to come out in a month. You would have to say they're willing to do not just City Hunter, but also this is a spinoff that is not technically canon. Right. I don't think that's going to happen. That's what I'm saying. I yeah. don't think they're going to go that far. I would like a trilogy. I must just be up front and say that. I want a trilogy, especially when it looks good. I'm wondering, is Umi Bozu even here for this one? Because it's so early on, like... But see, that's why I'm saying they need a sequel. I know, Because you could do a whole sequel on just Umi Bozu. Oh, I know. Like, if you do the first one as set up with Makimura, you do the second one with Umi Bozu, and then you do the last one, just kind of adapt Goodbye Hard Boiled City, it's all there. (laughs) I guess so. You could do it. It's right there. Netflix, make a smart decision. Come on now. They won't. They won't. They won't. They won't. We know what it is. <laughs> I mean, at, at least One Piece was good, and that gives me hope for this. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm actually feeling like this looks a lot better than some other Netflix adaptations we've seen. I mean, they're not all bad. Like, I thought Bleach was okay. I mean, I'll leave that up to you, because I've only seen one episode of Bleach. <laughs> Famously, yes, you've only seen the one episode. For right now, let's go ahead and get into today's episode, which is about a magician. Magician. Do I need to explain that? It's the shortest story, though. Every time I say magician like that, it's because I'm quoting a random-ass guy that I ran into at MAGFest because I was stuck outside the elevators, only one elevator was working, and I was waiting my turn to get on, and some really drunk guy walked past me, and he singled me out, and he points at me, and he goes, Hey, magician! I have no idea what he's talking about, and he just kind of drunkenly stumbles around, like, uh, you're the one who... And I'm like, who did what? Did you see me on the internet? And I'm like, no! You think I'm crazy! And then he mumbled something else, and then he stumbled away like he just forgot what he was doing. I say all that to say, every time I say, hey... Magician. Magician. That's that's, that's what you're That's quoting. the guy. That's the guy. Hope he's okay. Like, that was over a decade ago at this point. Hope he's all right. <laughs> So here at the top of the episode, we see that Kaori is out and about in Shinjuku heading over to the chalkboard to see if there's any jobs to pick up. Turns out there is one, and for whatever reason, this particular job has requested that only females be allowed on this job. Which, you know what? Good for them. Because Ryo needs to be removed from a lot of the process most of the time. That's usually why Kaori prefers to go down there alone. Kaori is very excited, like, wait a minute, that means I can do it. But she's so excited about it that she's attracting the attention of everybody else in the train station who's like, so is that a woman? I don't know, you know, times are changing, you know, could be anything. And it's like, really dudes? Like, we're doing this right now? That was kind of a weird interjection, but I I guess it was because she was just so excited to be a woman. It was kind of a, a, a weird outburst, I suppose. But the thing that makes it even weirder, and we were both commenting on this when we were re-watching the episode, is that Kaori here is drawn very cute for the entirety of the episode. Well, no, I just, I don't think it's weird. I think the whole episode is drawn like that, and it's not just Kaori. Everybody is drawn in a certain style that is kind of cute, a little pretty. Like, it's aesthetically pleasing to kind me. Kind of shoujo. It's somewhere in between shonen and shoujo. It's but between the it's two. It's also the thing that she's wearing, like, this nice little, like, almost tank top with a little watermelon on it and, like, capris. Yeah. I don't know how you could mistake her for a man. I, I don't see it. It's just Ryo being an asshole sometimes. But this time it's not Ryo. Ryo's actually just around the corner. Well, nobody's mistaking her for a man. They're just concerned because she's so vocal no, no, they and were, that was the joke there, is that they were convinced that was a man at the chalkboard. The reason they were convinced it was a man at the chalkboard was because she was excited about being a woman. That's the only reason why she was drawing any attention. Like, oh, she's a little too excited to be a woman, so... Is this a recent thing? Like, that's how you think they took it? Yeah. I see. Well, that that's still kind of like, hey, come on, get... It is kind of... That didn't age well Yeah, that's, at all. that's a different kind of shitty. But Rio is here, and he was trying to check 
check on the board too, but he's around the corner and he has heard that this is for women only. And his hair is standing up on end and he very specifically in Japanese, in English, says, my Mokori radar is going off. There is a beautiful woman involved with this. How do I know there's a beautiful woman? I can smell a beautiful woman's handwriting on the chalkboard. So we can add that to the list of Mokori powers he possesses. Not only can he correctly guess what kind of print is on your panties, he can also smell pretty handwriting from a woman. I mean, the handwriting was okay. I mean, it looked like normal handwriting. I yeah. Don't, like, that. okay, man, whatever. But Kaori goes ahead and meets up at a restaurant with her client for the week, who is a woman by the name of Naomi Okabe, who is an aspiring magician. I mean, she pretty much is a magician. It's just that she was being trained under a different magician, and that magician is not here now. He died a month ago. He, he is gone, so somebody else has to be the magician. Well, because specifically what it is, is this guy, the other magician that passed away, way was named Tenho and now the name is getting bequeathed to her as his student like you will be Tenho 2 Electric Boogaloo the sequel the sequel Tenho the sequel Except and, somebody really wants her to not be Tenho the sequel. And apparently they've been sending her threatening letters to be like, hey, don't do it or else I'ma kill you. Yeah, that seems a, a bit much. Murder somebody for just taking on the namesake of another magician? That seems kind of extreme to me. Yeah, if, if anything about this episode from our villain seems kind of petty, it absolutely is. Dude is very petty. And so Cowdy says, alright, so you just need me to be your bodyguard until this ceremony where you get named Tenho the sequel sequel happens, right? Yes, that's right. Also, I really can't have men around me. I'm gonna explain this to you since you're here, since you're a woman, since we're all women here, all right? I just freak out around men, and if they touch me, there's a possibility I could just black out, like I'm just gonna start forgetting things, I don't know what I'm doing, let's just not involve men in this. And Ryo hears this, because, because he has snuck around. He is also in there, sitting at the next booth, booth, holding up a newspaper with the sports section out. And so once Cowdy agrees, oh yeah, I'll absolutely take the case, that's when Ryo decides to blow his cover, throw the paper into the air, go up and grab Naomi's hand like, all right, I'm on this case, baby. And she does not take that very well because Ryo really does not pay attention to information that would be vital to him. And she just flips an entire booth. Well, just the the, the whole crazy booth. part about it, though, is for a Japanese show, the fact that they use the imagery of a nuke going off. Right, the big old mushroom cloud and shock waves coming off this mushroom cloud, which, uh, yeah, is very culturally important and very significant and would just really indicate just how bad of a reaction this is. It is that bad that they really felt like it is to be compared to a nuke going off. But remember what that means for everybody making that show. This is a cultural thing. Sure, for sure. And so that's the level she's at, having flipped reactions Yo's ass over a table and like crushed a potted plant on his head and then passing the hell out. So now they have to take her back to their apartment where she can wake up safe and sound. She just doesn't even remember going there. And Cowdy is yelling at Rio outside of the room like she's yelling at Rio out in like the living room or something. Now you know why you can't be doing this job. I got this. She can't be around men. Rio's response is, you know, shitty as usual. Like, well, well then who's gonna do it? You? And and the implication is, Cowrie, you're a man, ha 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 ha, misgendering is so funny. And of course she yeets his ass into the wall. As always, with a whole ass hammer, which is fine, he can just stay there for a while while Cowrie goes and comforts her while she wakes up. But she's not going to do a lot of comforting because Naomi wakes up with a start and is like, oh crap, I gotta go, I'm late for magic school. <laughs> For myself. And it's like actual practical magic, not like wizards and wands and, and stupid bullshit. No, it's and magician magic. Like, like cards. Vegas magic. Bunny rabbits. Stabbing people with swords in a box. That kind of shit. And so Cowrie's like, oh, you gotta go? Okay, well, well, I'll take you. Let's get in the car. Let's go. And they go driving down the highway, except when we see them driving down the highway, guess what? Rio has hitched a ride on the roof. Again, like 
like a perverted Spider-Man. <laughs> just hanging on for dear life. Just like, you tell me I can't do it, and that just means I'm gonna try even harder. As they're driving, Naomi's explaining to Cowdy how difficult her situation currently is, because the naming ceremony for her to be officially be called Tenho the Second is in three days. The problem is her big finishing magic act has been stolen. And that's not good, because she really needs to get this done before whoever stole it does it, so that she doesn't look like she's a copycat. All she knows about it is that somebody paid big money to steal this trick from her. And somebody has been out there buying up magic information and just stealing acts. So once they get to the magic shop, Naomi asks Cowdy, well, are you going to be my assistant? I need an assistant for this act. And Cowdy's like, well, that's what I do best. And she's like, okay, now get on stage. And she's like, no, wait, not like that. I'm not not that kind of assistant. But there's footsteps from down the hall, so somebody else is here, and she goes to check the door, and it is Rio. But it is a, a Rio that you might still be familiar with from last season. It's Rio in a dress and a wig. So this is Ryoko. Ryoko, yes. Rio having gone full drag race and has done himself actually better than last season. Oh yeah, he looks very pretty this time. Very he's, he's pretty. He's done a very good job. He's really structured his face very he's nicely. He's contoured. Yeah, he's contoured. Uh, he's chosen lip color that is very befitting for him. But also like this turquoise necklace man like what is up with the turquoise jewelry of the late 80s to mid 90s what like, was like up i with get that? that he's <laughs> pretending to be a woman right now for the case like he's going the mrs doubtfire route the necklace is way too but big. the necklace is like dude you're pretending to be a single woman in tokyo not a 30 something mom in suburbia yeah yeah but he has taken cowdy's clothes cowdy pulls him aside and asks what the hell are you doing here and he's like i have a sixth sense about these things you need backup something's wrong here so that's why I'm here like this. You know, if I'm doing this, it's serious. Sure, it's serious. He's And he is partly serious about it. But also, he really wants to come up and talk to Naomi, like, real bad. And Naomi's falling for it. She genuinely believes that Ryo is... Ryoko, as she is being introduced to her right now. The thing about it, though, is as Cowdy is grabbing onto Ryo's collar, which again is her dress, she's able to pull down the dress and see underneath to what he's wearing because he's gone the whole nine. So that includes undergarments and that includes a bra, but it's not just any bra. It is Cowrie's bra, and it is the nicest, most expensive bra she owns. And we have been saying this since day damn one that she was introduced. He knows where she hides the good shit. <laughs> Just the nice stuff. Uh, but he that picked is... the nice stuff. That's the thing. Like, as Ryoko, as that version of themselves, I'll even say, he decided to go for that one. Rio is not uncomfortable doing this. No, this he's is, not. He's very good at this, right? I feel like as time has gone on, any little bit of really weird homophobia or transphobia that has shown up in this show in the past... I feel has largely been weaned out of Rio specifically. Now, would you say that's kind of a, a growth in his character? It's, or it's, it's just either a reflecting growth, the time. It's either a growth in his character, or it's even a growth in Hojo himself as, oh, that's all, that could as be true, a storyteller, yeah. deciding, no, Rio would be okay with this, and I'm okay with presenting Rio this way, you know? I mean, maybe it's better that way that he starts one way and then becomes more accepting as the series goes on. Yeah, I, I would say that it's worth noting. What's kind of weird after this, though, is that Kaori has realized, wait a minute, if Ryo is wearing my bra, is he wearing my underwear? So it's weird that she goes to flip up Ryo's dress. To in check. front of Naomi. In front of Naomi. Um, like, normally I would say, hmm, maybe let's not do that. Though I slightly understand the circumstances because Kaori genuinely believes Ryo is wearing her undergarments, which he is on top, but apparently he isn't below. And he brags, oh, I wear my own underwear, my own panties. Thank you very much. And whatever it is that he's wearing, we don't see it. But Kaori didn't like what she saw. Like she so basically says, I can't unsee what I just saw. And so we have to wonder here well what did she see i mean it could just be as simple as she saw wang and was <laughs> not prepared for that 
Or um, like, did he go the full nine and do a really good tuck job? And it, she wasn't expecting that. I'm, I'm good. I'm really hoping that I'm going I'm just gonna say it's not that because it would be really shitty if he did like a good job at doing that and decided that was something to be grossed out by. Uh, well, yeah, true. I, I guess it could be just that something as simple as maybe what he picked wasn't fitting correctly. That's what I'm thinking. But that's the thing, though. He bought his own underwear, his own women's underwear, because he says panties. Right. Okay. He specifies women's underwear. So, so the question is, did he go out and buy them, or did he just have some on him? Like, I wouldn't necessarily put it past him. Which means at some point he went out and bought some. Now, mind Did you, he keep them from the last time he dressed up as Ryoko? Maybe. Maybe he was wearing women's underwear that time, too. I mean, now right. I have to assume he was. So he owns... Uh, okay, the dress is not his. The dress is also The dress coward. and the bra are not the his. The dress and the bra are not his. The so wig is his. The wig is his, and apparently so are the underwear. Like, he keeps that stuff around, and he's he's not uncomfortable with it. So... Rio, is there something cool? you want to tell everybody that you're cool with? I mean, we'll be cool with you. I mean, we are cool with well, it. I mean, we are, yeah, but it's like... But, and, just... and, and Kauri is... I don't think she is uncomfortable with the idea of him dressing that way, only with the idea that the clothes are hers. Right, because that's basically stealing. Right. So now they have to pretend that Kaori and Ryoko are sisters. This is where we're at right now. We're pretending they're sisters. But in any case, Ryo is really playing up that he's very impressed, or I'm sorry, Ryoko is very impressed by magic, and they have this really detailed card unfurling animation that they're using for Naomi. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they repainted a couple of times to show, hey, these are different card tricks, but it's totally, they only had enough to do it the one time. Yeah, yeah. And then into the magic office walks our asshole for the week, a magician by the name of Ishikawa, who looks a little bit like Liberace with just slightly less rhinestones. But definitely a douche. He he's, just has he's air a, of douche. Air of rich douche. Yeah. Because he's coming in like, hey, baby, it turns out you got to get the hell out of here because I bought this building outright from your dead boss. So get the hell out. Oh, hey, can I at least get three more days until like the naming ceremony? And he's like, fuck you, get out by the end of the day. Okay, bye. And then it's like, well, damn, how do I work on my magics? I don't have a place to do my magics. Oh, yes, you do. Because Ryoko comes in and is like, well, you can do it at our place. We got lots of space and you can practice all the magic you want over there. Oh, really? Well, let's go do that then. Let's go do that magic. So we head over to the apartment and I think think we're at the garage. That's because the only place I can imagine. We see Kauri and Rio's cars. The Fiat and the Mini Cooper. They're parked next to each other, and then there's just a shit ton of space. There is so much space in there, Josh. There's That's so the much thing. space it looks, in there. It looks like a gymnasium. That's how much space is in there. Like a high school gymnasium's worth of space. And a really high ceiling. So I'm over here trying to... Like, I've been theorizing this for a while and I didn't say anything yet. If it was the garage, that'd be one thing. But I've always tried to figure out, since the beginning of the show, what the hell are on the first three floors? Like, maybe the first three floors are just dummy floors and it's all just, like, space. Like, open space. Because the thing about it is, we saw when we covered 357 Magnum last week, if we look at the elevator, we see that... That there's five floors, the roof, and then two sub basements there at Rio's apartment building. Right. And we know floors four and five are both Cowdy and Rio's floors, respectively. The gun range is on the very bottom, and then the basement should be where the garage is. Right. So what the hell are on floors one through three? I don't know. I genuinely do not know. Like, I, I don't know whether or not they, they thought people would be questioning that later. I think they just decided, oh, well, we need a space for her to train, so we're just going to draw one in. <laughs> like, they're not thinking about like what the continuity actually Right now, is. we are the nerds in Galaxy Quest trying to figure out how the ship actually is fit together and how it works practically. Even though that was never designed for that purpose, nobody ever actually thought of that. I can only hope they took that into consideration for the Netflix show. Uh Uh-huh. Because we can see back there, like, we see them up on the roof of what I assume is their apartment building, but again, that is me assuming. Yeah, hard to say. It is hard to say. Either way, they're practicing. Cowdy's now in this cute, like, Zatanna assistant magician's outfit. You know, the stereotypical kind. For Vegas shows. For Vegas shows, yes. And then Ryoko is there commenting on, Hey, look at that. Look at your outfit. And Cowdy's like, Oh, so you finally noticed I'm attractive. And of course, Ryoko is talking about Naomi's legs in her magician outfit. 
So Ryoko is bouncing up and down in her drag outfit going, Wow, you know, even though I'm a woman, you sure are beautiful. <laughs> this fucking liar. I mean, he, he does think that. He does think she's attractive. But like, even though I'm a woman. Like, he has to qualify that or else he thinks... Or I mean, or else the act doesn't work. Yeah. Cowdy's assisting Naomi with this trick of getting into a box and then disappearing and reappearing several feet away. And she's like, wow, how do you do that? And she actually gives away, Naomi gives away the secret to the trick because this is going to be important later. Oh, well, the, the answer to the trick is that, like, I go up these stairs that are built connected to the box for me to get in. Well, the, the box has a hole in it that goes back into the staircase and I just slide into the staircase and I hide in there. And the stairs are actually painted in such a way that it makes them look more narrow than they actually are, so it's kind of an optical illusion going along with it. Calorie's like, oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, all right, yeah. And so just briefly, over on the other side of town, we see this Ishikawa guy just chilling in his pool. Because he's rich enough that he's got a pool. And a mansion. And a mansion. And, and like, this is a guy in, in Japan, and especially around the Tokyo area where there's not a whole heck of a lot of space we've got a mansion and a pool and he's chilling in the pool and he's like throwing peanuts up into the air and and eating them while he's laying in the pool on an inflatable raft and taking a business call like hey so uh has that chick quit magic yet and whoever's on the other end of the phone's like no she hasn't quit yet she's still going well, what about the trick I stole? Uh, how many days is it going to take for me to pull that off and get it ready to go? Well, it's going to take about 10 days. Uh, let's see, 10 divided by minus 3. That's not long enough for me to do it. We're going to kill her. We're just going to murder the girl. Which, I mean, they already threatened to do. So that was already kind of in the cards. Um, and now we're going to really make that happen. At least that's the plan. And it, the conversation goes that quickly. Like, he very quickly decides, yeah, murder. Yeah, well, murder's good. Like ordering a we'll pizza. just murder the girl. So later that night, back over at Kauri and Ryo's, they're all eating dinner together. Ryoko is very hastily Naruto or Goku style, eating a big ass bowl of rice and just making a mess of herself. Which Kauri is like, ha ha ha, look at the way my sister eats. Isn't that really manly? And Naomi's like, yeah, I mean, I guess. And she's fussing at him like, hey, get that off your face. And they're kind of fussing back and forth, the two of them. And Naomi remarks, man, you guys are really similar. <laughs> Which both Rio and Kaori don't react very well to that, even though it's totally true. But Rio has wiped food off on the sleeve of the dress that he's wearing, and Kaori is very upset about that because it's her dress. Like, there you go, getting my dress all messy. And she has to eventually, sometime later, pull Rio away and get all these clothes off of him. Like, I can't have you messing up my clothes. And Rio's like, this is the only thing I can wear. The illusion doesn't work if I don't have the dress. And Coward's like, not my problem anymore. Guess you're just going to have to deal with it. But nobody's going to deal with it right the second because off screen, we hear a scream. Ah. So they have to go running up the stairs to the guest room or Cowdy's room, whichever one it is, to try and check on Naomi. And it's funny that Rio very quickly has to throw back on the wig and the dress. And he's like, wait, hold on, wait for me. But he's already got the dress like only halfway down his face and just runs right into the wall. It's great. <laughs> it's very good. And just falls over. And so in the room, Naomi is on the floor like completely turned white. She is scared out of her mind. Cowdy busts in there. What's wrong? What's going on? What's in here? And it turns out it's a pair of Rio's boxers. That's it. It's just the only indication that a man has been around. And she's still terrified of men. And so boxers indicating a man might be around is a very terrifying thing to her. And so Rio has to come in here as Ryoko and explain, oh, those are mine. I mean, my boyfriend. Yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah, that, that's who they belong to. And thankfully, Naomi buys it. She buys a lot this episode, honestly. She goes along with quite a lot. And now that they're by themselves, Cowdy is talking to Naomi and trying to get to the core of, so why is it you have this male phobia of yours? And Naomi's explaining to her, well, it's the way I was raised. I was raised with all sisters. I went to an all-girls school. I just, I have no filter against men. And I just, I don't like being touched to begin with. And it just makes me really uncomfortable. Which I get that. I think that makes quite a bit of sense honestly and straight from the beginning 
beginning, although it wasn't totally assault, Ryo shouldn't have just come up out of nowhere, totally not introduced, just complete strangers, and tried to touch her hand. I would have freaked the fuck out myself. That would have really bothered me. Funny enough, I saw this post going around Twitter today of like, uh, you see two elves, two female elves at an Applebee's. How do you hit on them? And the res- the quote retweet I saw was like, I leave them the hell alone because they're eating at Applebee's. I mind my own damn business. Yeah, exactly. Ryo does not know how to do that. He d- really does not. But to kind of create some distance between Naomi and Ryoko, Kaori again impresses upon Naomi, hey, so like my sister, right? Don't you think she's so manly? Don't you think that's weird and kind of off-putting? It seems like she just really wants the truth to come out so that they don't have to keep up the charade anymore. That's the way it comes off to me. From right? Kaori, at Kaori. least. From yeah. That having been said, Naomi's like, yeah, I mean, maybe, I guess, except, I don't know, I'm doing okay around her, because, I mean, she's a woman, right? Like, it's not a big deal. And you know what? Every time I'm around her, I just seem to get, like, these kind of feelings. And I don't know what that's about. And that might be kind of weird, you know, because we're both women. But, oh well, I guess I'll just tell you this because that's how I feel. Like, she's not even questioning. I know that the answer in the universe of the show is, oh, well, she feels that way because she is straight and she doesn't realize she's attracted actually to a man. Ha ha ha. A very cis man. A very cis man. But the way it's coming across is that Ryoko might be her lesbian awakening. Well, yeah, she's like, not even questioning, not even concerned, like, hmm, is there a possibility I might at least be a little bit gay? Is that a possibility that I might be bi or gay or pan or something? Hmm, I guess I'll just accept it. I guess, like, if that's what it is, that's what it is. And, like, there's just not even a concern, like, oh, no, what does this mean? Oh, no. There's none of that. And Cowdy kind of gets this look on her face, like, ah, that didn't work, which more seems to me like, ah, crap, I didn't embarrass Rio, and less that, oh, she's she's a little gay. That's weird. It's not that at all. That's not how it came off. No, because Cowdy in no way comes across as uncomfortable being around her after hearing that information or anything, you know. I really just think, like, look, man, I guess that's something. You having feelings for Ryoko. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay. Hmm. Shoot. I wasn't able to separate Ryo from this picture. (laughs) And the good news is, Ryo isn't even in the apartment anymore because across the street, over on that one part of the roof across the street that the snipers post up on. Because they always like to go there because it's the only place they can snipe from. There's a sniper there. Right now. Right now. And he's got his sight trained on Naomi, and he's about to pull the trigger. But Ryo's there, and he's like, bet you don't want to do that, because I got my gun on the back of your head. And dude turns around all slow and sees what kind of gun it is. And this dude, to his credit, whatever hitman that Ishikawa hired is a smart hitman. Because as soon as he sees the barrel and sees the 357 python written on it, he's like... 357 Python Magnum, that means you're... Uh Uh-huh, you get it now? Get the hell out of here. Yeah, so he knows that it's City Hunter. He knows, ah, shit, we fucked with the wrong people. And the dude, to his credit, understands the situation and he leaves and he doesn't try to fuck with it anymore. And And he calls Ishikawa and he's like, like, I can't take this job. I'm out, man. You don't know who we were fucking with. This was City Hunter. And Ishikawa's like, excuse me? City Hunter? Well, fuck City Hunter. Who cares? I paid you a shit ton of money, man. You better give me that money back. We're doing this. And if you're not gonna do a murder, then I'm gonna do a murder myself with my own hands on the day of the naming ceremony i'm gonna just do it myself it it comes across very much like that scene in the first john wick movie where i think it's kevin nash you know john wick shows up behind him and introduces like hey man i'm back oh john it's you hey man why don't you go take the night off thank you john and then he takes (laughs) off it's like that that's the level of fear that got instilled in this guy when he recognized oh shit it's city hunter right but it turns out that ceremony the naming ceremony it's tomorrow which is now today so we're all out at the stadium we really sped run this particular story which i'm glad for actually because sometimes it feels like two parters are like did we really need it to be two parts this one felt fine yeah I, it's I all self-contained one episode mostly okay with the pacing of this episode and so funny enough ishikawa is gonna go ahead and do the murder but he's got a 
disguise on, so you can't really tell it's him, even though it's totally his hair. It's still him, but with a mustache and glasses. <laughs> like, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a piss poor disguise. And he's carrying a cane. The cane will be important later. And so backstage, Cowdy is actually the one getting nervous. Like, oh crap, I hope we do well. I hope we do all these things well. Naomi's asking, where's Ryoko? And Cowdy tells her, oh, she's out patrolling, making sure nobody weirds around here. Naomi's just, again, being like, man, I feel so calm when she's around. I don't know what it is. I just, she's I really like don't... holding a rose and looking at it like, oh, man, I hope Ryoko's here. I'm like, are you going to give this nice tall lady a flower? <laughs> like, <laughs> she's thinking things. Yeah. Like, well, maybe if this goes well, you know, who knows? But the act starts and the crowd loves her. She's doing a bunch of card tricks. Bunnies appearing out of nowhere. Little chicks in glasses. Like, baby chicks. Like, chicken chicks. Yes. Not women chicks. No. Although I feel sorry for the rabbits because we're pulling them out of the hat by their ears. I always feel sad every time I see somebody do that. But it's okay. It turns out the rabbit was made out of cords. <laughs> yeah, maybe it wasn't even a real rabbit. I'm gonna just hope it wasn't a real rabbit. And then the cards all get magically stacked back in her hand perfectly and the bunny lands on top of the cards in her hand and everybody's like, oh! Yay! And while all this is going on, Rio has actually posted up up in the rafters above the stage with a silencer on his magnum ready if anything goes down if any shit hits the fan and so it's time for the final act for the final trick that Naomi's gonna do for the day which is going to be the thing that seals giving her the name of Tenho the sequel and what's required of this act is for five volunteers to be called up from the audience and wouldn't you know it Ishikawa is the fifth one because he's a t- He's just kind of the most middle-aged, ooh, me, me, like jumping out of his seat almost, you know. Like, he's not jumping, jumping, but it's the most enthusiastic you can be when you're a middle-aged man and you have to pretend that it's hard to walk when you've got a cane. And you're also about to do a murder. So five dudes get called up to the stage and they're about to do, hey, guess what? It's the trick that they were talking about earlier that was explained to Calorie about go into the box and then we hide in the stairs and, you know, it's that, it's that trick. And these five guys are about to take some swords, and when she gets in that box, they're gonna stab the box, and they're gonna be like, oh no, we murdered this poor woman, and then she's supposed to pop out of the box and be like, haha, I haven't been murdered. And that's how that trick is supposed to go. But the thing about it is, since Ishikawa paid for the trick already, he knows how it works. So he knows, oh, she's going to slide into the stairs to avoid getting murdered by the swords in the stabby and the box and the stuff. So all I have to do is take my cane, which is actually its own sword, and stab the stairs so that she can't just slide down the stairs. Not without injuring herself or getting stuck in the box, which of course both happen. So here she goes. She goes and she gets in the box and she's like, all right, audience, I'll see you later. Bye. And then they close the box and then she starts to slide down and there's that sword. He has stabbed into the staircase and she's like, hey, what the fuck? And there's, <laughs> and she can't slide down because like, yeah, she's she's about to injure herself. Oh, no, there's already a sword coming in at me because one of the audience members has been given the sword and we all assume this is how the trick is supposed to go. And he's stabbing the box and he's just like, well, she's gonna get out of it. I guess it's fine. And it just goes all the way through and she's gotta like tilt her head a little bit to avoid getting additional stabbage. And she's trying to kick off the sword. She can't really tell what it is, but like she gets her shoe off and tries kicking against it. So now her foot's bleeding. So that sucks. So she's in pain and she's trying to like not make noise and avoid all these swords. Here comes a second sword and like a third sword. And Rio is up in the rafters and he's like, huh, so Something is wrong. And what is up with this guy? This this fucker did something. And so he quickly deduces, oh, I see the cane that's stuck in the stairs. All right, I know what I got to do. I just got to shoot and break the cane. That's fine. But Ishikawa's an asshole, right? Somehow, I guess he did listen to the fact that City Hunter's involved. And so he figured, okay, if City Hunter's here, the place he would need to be to break the cane is right directly over my shoulder. So I'm going to stand immediately in front of the cane cane to make sure he can't break it because if he's gonna break it he has to shoot through me and and he's he's not gonna do that he's gonna ruin the show and he's not gonna ruin the show so (laughs) he waits he waits until it is the last minute and that guy is the last guy yeah ishikawa gets the last sword and he's aware of okay if i've done this right her neck's gonna be right here where i'm putting the sword i'm gonna kill your ass right now and he's like slowly driving it in but that gives rio the opportunity 
opportunity to do this crazy ricochet shit, which does, like, bounce around where it needs to bounce around on other swords or some shit, and then break the sword that was in the way of her being able to slide down the stairs, and then she can slide down the stairs, and then somehow Ryo is, like, under the stage? Like, he instant transmissioned from the rafters to underneath the stage. And he has caught her, and he has bandaged her foot. Like, she blacked out at some point. And her foot is bandaged, and she's mostly fine. Like, it still hurts, but she, she'll she get through the rest of it without alerting the audience that there's been some kind of a problem. And she's starting to wake up, and at first, she sees kind of... Like, seeing Ryo's image looks like Ryo Ko because, like, they are the same person. So she's she's not worried about it at first until her eyes kind of adjust and she sees, well, it's you, but you're a dude? And she starts freaking out on him. And then Ryo has to be like, hey, 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 you ain't got time for that right now. You need to finish this trick and get back up there. Whatever your phobia is, don't worry about that. If it's tied to me being a man, don't even worry about me being a man or you being a woman. Hey, we're just people here on planet earth it's all cool it's all chill we're all just people he's he's mostly talking sense right now he's not really being a creepazoid at the moment honestly no he's, this is actually a very kinda, positive message he's kind of right doing here. a good job at the moment so a g- good job right now rio we need to encourage this man when he does things correctly we do see? we do actually and we, give credit where credit is due we we do not credit him when he is not doing the right thing but but if we credit him when he's doing the right thing maybe he will learn from the positive reinforcement you can only hope so right now his you know forget that gender spiel that he's giving to her seems to have worked and she gets up on stage and finishes the trick which is just reappearing yeah and somehow ishikawa is now in the box and he's trapped by swords and he's like no let me out of here and you can only hope that maybe he got arrested for attempting to do a murder we don't know though we don't know we can only assume sayako did it if she actually did police work you know she doesn't do that yeah she does weird interpol shit and we don't know where she is (laughs) and who she's arresting out in international waters what her jurisdiction actually is i guess her jurisdiction isn't even tokyo it is literally everything other you know, it Tokyo. turns out we, we've got it all wrong. She's Agent S of the Japanese branch of the Men in Black. That's oh, why she okay. has jurisdiction. She, she's from Division 6. That's what I'm saying. There is no Division 6. So now that everything has been wrapped up in a nice bow, Naomi is thanking Ryo and Cowdy. Like, thank y'all so much for helping me with the trick and getting me over my fear of men. It's so great that you helped me out. And Ryo's like, well, thank you for thanking me. Let me thank myself by immediately groping your breasts. Man, we got we so We just tried to close. give you credit, Ryo. We you were so You couldn't make so it. There's less close. than a minute left in this episode, man. You couldn't do it? You couldn't make it another 60 seconds? She wasn't even weirded out in any way that you dressed in drag. She she was, like, very cool with you. She was very okay with you. She supported you. She might have even still liked you and not even cared what gender meant. She really might be pan for you, man. You had this one in the bag. And then you had to drop it at the five-yard line. Like, what the hell, man? And so naturally, we see the mushroom cloud as Naomi grabs the nearest trash can and, like, does a Yakuza heat action on his ass. Which is fair. He deserved it. He had it coming. And for whatever reason, now he's got the trash can balanced on his head while he poses like the Buddha here in the last freeze frame. They thought it was funny. Also, Kaori has a hammer. I guess she pulled it out because she thought she might need to use it and then she didn't need to use it. I mean, she's probably still going to use it. She'll hit him eventually. There's no such thing as a wasted hammer with Kaori. That's true. And that's where the episode ends. All right. Yeah. yeah. That, that that one is fine for just being very self-contained, very quick story. Like, I'm kind of okay with that one after so many oh my god we just got all these two parters holy crap and now we're about to do a three parter i know what and so is th- this? Th- the thing about it though was because the action was so fast paced the plot was so fast paced it felt like the first half of the episode was nothing but exposition dialogue yeah this is who i am this is who my teacher was that's who this guy is this is how the trick works this is what we gotta do this is how much time we have left and it's like oh my god like c- can somebody say something as a character <laughs> <laughs> like, d- don't just give me an information dump for 15 minutes. Like, can we have some character moments? Which, you know, it, it happened every once in a while. Every, you know, few minutes, there would be a moment. I mean, I guess 
Again, it's not the worst episode of City Hunter. I, I think it's a pretty middle-of-the-road one, faring on the better side for the positive gender conversation that it strikes up, I should say. Yeah, like, it's not 100% great, but there are moments like, hey, he was kind of thinking about something here. Hojo was, when he was drawing Hojo this. was. Hojo like, was thinking about something uh, This here. mofo's spitting right now. Yeah, which supposedly in his F Compo manga series, like that we idea. We still need to find a copy of that. We do. Like, I mean, that was never published officially in English in the first place. That's part of it. But supposedly Hojo like pushes these ideas even farther in that manga and doesn't always get it right but like he had some thoughts and like they didn't all suck and I just hear a lot of praise for that series. So for as shit as Hojo has been in his storytelling as far as gender identity is concerned uh, sometimes he's, he's very accepting and like like, maybe, maybe a little progressive. Yeah, maybe we should embrace that when it does come up, especially for its time. Because yes. I think that's the balancing act that this title is doing sometimes, is that it is fighting against the stereotypes of its time period, mm -hmm. while also kind of trying to creep in and introduce, like, but what if we were cool with this, though? And we we laughed about it, but we laughed about it in, like, a forward moving good, way. affirmative sort of ways, yeah. you know? I think we see a lot more of that in the later seasons and some of the movies more so, if I'm not mistaken. Sure, I would agree with that. But yes, like we just said, coming up here, it's the last three episodes of City Hunter 2, and this is one big three-parter. There's some heavy content in these last three episodes, Yeah, to this be is sure. all plot relevant. We're going to be introducing a character that we haven't met before, but is very familiar with Ryo's past. I believe this is yet another previous partner of Rios from, yes. from his past. And now Kaori is going to be feeling very insignificant for a while, you know? Kind of left out in the cold compared to all the information we're about to be given here in these last three episodes. It's going to be exciting. Hope you guys look forward to that. Yeah, that's coming up real soon. Yeah. So come back next time when we cover the 61st episode of City Hunter 2. Good luck, my sweeper. City Streets for both of us, part one. And if you want to catch us outside this podcast, you can always find us both over on most social media. I'm at Josh Knight first. And I'm at Mars Girl. Thank you all so much for listening to our 112th episode of Moko Replay. And if you don't come back next episode, Josh will be shocked! I might be shocked, you might be shocked, you are shocked, but maybe I'm a lion. Pretty sure you're just Josh. Yeah, last time I checked. Damn.